Welcome to episode four of Talking Prisoner Presents. Today, we've got another huge guest with us. He's known for his long-running role in one of Australia's most popular TV shows for its entire run, and also as a policeman in Matlock Police. He has also appeared in Homicide, The Vision 4, Ryan, Bluey, The Sullivans, The Box, Chopper Squad, Cop Shop, Bellamy, Richmond Hill, The Flying Doctors, A Country Practice, Water Rats, Big Sky, Murder Call, and All Saints. He also played the husband of a long-running character in Home and Away. We're, of course, talking about Tom Richards, who played David Palmer in Sons of Daughters. Welcome to Talking Prisoner Presents. Yeah, thank you very much. Great gig after all that. I didn't know all that. Wow, God. <laughs> there was a lot more. I couldn't fit it all in. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a yeah, couple from New Zealand, but doesn't matter. That was great. Thank you. What an introduction. <laughs> Now, um, all the fans will want to talk about sons and daughters, but we'd just like to learn a little about your life growing up. Where did you grow up as a child? I was on my uh, Queenslander, actually. I was born in uh, Brisbane, but we moved down to Redcliffe, uh, which is on the, on the water, and uh, spent all my life there. And that's where I actually started acting. I didn't start straight away. I was uh, a sales yeah. rep uh, selling movies, actually, for Paramount Pictures. Oh, wow. And a few other jobs. Uh, and then I finished up with Heinz. But then I started, uh, someone, when I was working for, I think, with the Waltons, a lady asked me, did I want to do some acting? And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll give it a go. So, because uh, I used to love playing cowboys and Indians with the guys and all that, you know, or fight the pillow with all that rubbish when I was young. So, yeah, I thought I'd give it a go. And I did, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and the first play, first night, big round of applause. And I came on, and when I went off, of course, my whole, my whole family were there. <laughs> but after that, my family never ever came to another theatre, <laughs> another play. So there you go. But after that, uh, and I liked it so much, and then I moved up to, uh, started doing plays and that in Queensland, a 12th night theatre. And then a friend of mine, she said, you should go and do an audition for Crawford's. They're always looking for auditions. So uh, that was around 71. So I went down to Crawford's in 71, yeah, uh, November 71. Did an audition. Uh, Loretta Healy ran after me and she said, uh, when are you coming down? And I said, oh, I don't know, probably June next year after I finish up doing some plays. But what they wanted, they were looking for someone to replace Terry Donovan because he was going into hospital. They wanted someone to replace him for Division 4. And in those days, if you had a rough head, uh, you could either be a cop or a crook. So it was pretty fortunate. Uh, and then I came down in July of that, uh, 72, and I was doing, you know, homicides and all that in Division 4. And then September, I finished up doing an audition. I don't know what it was for, but it was actually for Matlock Police. So I was very fortunate. But uh, I think I've digressed a bit when you said where. But, I, yeah, I grew up and lived in Redcliffe. Yeah. Awesome. You're up in your school days. Uh, did you have any favourite subjects or any subjects you hated? Yeah, there's a lot of subjects I hated. The best one I used to like was... The one when the bell rang and you went home. I'm like, that's <laughs> <laughs> but I was more or less sports orientated. I really liked you know, football and hockey and all those things. And I followed them when I left when I left school and when I went to high school. But uh, no, I, uh, I don't think I was a great scholar in any way. I've learned more since I've left school. I mean, I <laughs> finished up um, doing uh, um, reviews for the Manly Daily on movies and on stage plays. So I uh, must have learned something to be able to do that. But yeah, <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't say I was a great scholar. <laughs> what was one of your first jobs out of school? What was one of the first things you did? Oh, look, I was still in school. I think it was about 10 or 11 or something like that, or 12 maybe, I don't know. But I was a telegram boy. Oh, okay. I used to ride the push bike around, uh, Redcliffe, delivering telegrams. Because I think the chap in the post office knew my dad. And, uh, he said, well, I like to do it. And I said, yeah. So that was my first job. Disappointing thing about those days, you knew what was on the telegram before you lived, delivered it. Wow. And um, I delivered one where someone was told a relation of them had passed away or had been killed in an accident. Oh, and when God. I gave it to him, I felt a bit, you know, at my age, oh, my God. So I felt a bit, uh, a bit sad about all that. But in those days, of course, the telegrams were printed out. Yeah. And you can see the telegrams when they tore it off and gave it to him. Yeah. Wow. But that was the first job, and then I think I went. Uh, what else? 
Yeah, after that, when I left school, I went into advertising uh, for a mob in Brisbane. Left that, then became a ticket writer for Woolworths, or one of those. I left that, and then I finished up with Cook's Travel Agency as a, learning to be a, a consultant. And that's when I had a nasty accident, which laid me up for three years, so I never worked. Three years, wow. Yeah, yeah got smashed up in the <clears> leg. Uh, and then when I came back, I finished up doing, uh, working for Coles and travelling all around Queensland. And then I finished up, I think I went Paramount Pictures then. Okay. So I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> your, um, your parents, your, your, uh, what, what were they up to in that, at that time? You know, my dad, he was in the First World War. Wow. Um, he joined up, I think he's underage, but he joined up for the First World War, then got wounded over in France because... I think he, I, The Hill 33 or 36, whatever that movie was about The Hill. You know, they, they made that movie about The Hill. Um, there's an article that came out. My nephew got it and uh, he sent it down to me. My dad actually was tied up, was working in that, that area for a while. But then he got wounded and went to England and came back. And uh, I think he worked on the trams. And then the Second World War came and he went out to do that. And my mum used to be a... Uh, a seamstress or something like that. But then she, when she became a, got married and had children, of course, she was just a stay-at-home mum. Yeah. And what they think about you getting into the uh, entertainment industry? Uh, my dad, actually, he was very, he, he was passed away by then, but uh, he was very keen on me to audition for Smiley. You know when Smiley came out? You know, all those years ago? Colin yep. Peterson? Colin Peterson actually was a friend of mine. He used to live down the road. We used to play together. He had all these good games. But my dad, he said, oh, you should have gone. We should put you in for that. And my mum was saying, oh, no, no, I can remember that. <laughs> so he would have been very pleased to know that I finished up working as an actor somewhere. He was, yeah. But, uh, and so was my mum. My mum was keen. She'd do, sit there and watch all the shows. Yeah. Apart from Queensland, do you have a favourite holiday destination? Oh... We've been a fair way. I mean, I've been overseas quite a few times. I don't mind. I don't mind the south of France, around that area. I quite like it down there. If I could, I'd go over there and spend a winter over there, down living around there, that area. Yeah. Saint Tropez and Pez, I think something like that. Around that area, it was really nice down there. Mm. Yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if you have any spare time uh, these days, but do you have any hobbies you like to do in your spare time? Well, I used to do cartoons for the Women's Day, and I stopped. I stopped that years ago, but I'm trying to get back into it again. Just doing cartooning. Oh wow! Um, yeah, the only other—it's a hobby, really. I mean, I do a lot of directing for the local theatre group. Have done for the last eight years. That's why I'm tied up right now doing one. So, uh, yeah, no, mainly I just go swimming, bike riding. Yeah, run the rebounder, do all those little things. Some old fella. Mm. <laughs> During the um, pandemic, how, how's life treated you with the lockdowns and so forth? Oh, pretty good, actually. I, I, I've, I mean, yeah, I've accepted it, I guess, and just go along. I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not running around a lot. I mean, I don't go out. I go out, you know, bike riding and things, and then I go into a, a shop or something. I always put a mask on and do the right thing by what you're supposed to do. But it hasn't, um, I haven't been locked in, you know, I haven't been locked in the house. I've been able to get out and walk around. So uh, it's a bit frustrating. So the, the only thing I find frustrating is you guys might, every time you go somewhere, you've got to do a QR code. <laughs> and lately you come mm. home and three days later, someone says you've been in this place and someone <laughs> was there at the same time had COVID. You go, oh my God, but uh, yeah. Text message. I'm sure you're finding that too. Yeah, that a few times. Do you uh, do you like to do any cooking at all? You good in the kitchen? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do my um, most times. I can make my own dinner. Um, <laughs> not all the time. But most times, I, I'm I'm into a bit of plant based uh, meal and um, a diet. Yes. So I'm mainly plant based a little bit, but I still have my fish and a bit of meat every now and then. Yeah. So I just cook up something on a plant base. I've got all these recipes here. I never look at them. So <laughs> when I go out. I'll just put a few things together uh, or go to the shop and buy something that's plant-based. Yeah. yeah. It's a good diet. It's pretty good, actually. 
Yeah, there's a big change when you go on it. I've noticed that too. Oh, you, you'd like the day? Yeah, yeah. Like well, I used to eat a lot of meat, but then, you know, watch all those documentaries on Netflix about, you know, don't eat meat. And uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger himself coming out and saying plant-based is the way to go. Yeah. But, uh, you do notice a difference. Yeah, definitely. Oh, you do. Yeah. When you stop the dairy stuff and all that other stuff, you, yeah. you do find a difference. Yeah. Although sometimes I say, why did I do it? Because I seem to be getting more little things happening to me <laughs> than, uh, than I did before. Yeah. But I'm into I'm, another thing I'm into is earthing. You know about earthing and grounding? No, what's that? Oh, uh, grounding. It's like, uh, you know, there's, uh, you put your feet on the ground, there's that earthing, you connect with the earth free radicals and so forth come in your body. And then you can buy stuff now. Uh, some guy in America discovered it years ago and they have these uh, pads or have sheets that are connected to the earth. Oh, really? Plug. Yeah, and uh, when you sleep on that, you're more <clears throat> relaxed. So I'm, I'm pretty big into that. Uh, is that, is it a big difference in your life doing that or? You sleep very well. You know, soon you hit the pillow and you're out to it. Oh, wow. And you're really... You really go off to sleep very, very quickly and you wake up fairly refreshed you know, as long as you don't get up too much during the night. But you wake up feeling a bit of difference. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Any aches and pains, you sit on the couch. I've got one there on the couch. You sit back and you get a bit drowsy with it. Uh, but any pain seems to go away. Sounds it's pretty amazing. good. Yeah. It's called earthing. There's a few videos out on it. One guy, American guy up in Alaska, got one. He made one. He's a... Uh, you know, video production company, and he made one call the grounded, and uh, he follows everyone. He he changed the whole little town where he lived. He gave them all these earthing things, and people recover from a lot of complaints. Wow! So it was pretty good actually. Earthing. Mm. I'll have a look into it. Do you want? Do you have an all-time favourite film movie? Oh, well, I don't have an all um, favorite. I guess the one that I liked most of all was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I thought that was exciting, quite adventurous. Yeah, um, yeah that's about the one I, I, I liked. I went to see that about three or four times. But other than that, no, I, I don't really. I just watch them and enjoy them or see the acting or directing and you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's another shot or that's a cut. <laughs> It's they keep theory. thinking about that. Yeah. Now you, so, mentioned, no, 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 no. you mentioned the uh, 12th Night Theatre just before. Now, I just want to quickly talk about that. In 1971, you had a role in the Rose and the Ring. And it's also that theatre's had some people like John Inman, Gordon Kay, Sue Hodge, John English, Lorraine Bailey, Dennis Waterman, and, of course, yourself. So what are your memories of working at that theatre? It had some pretty... Uh, well, they, they weren't there when I was there. Well, they must have came up and did another play. Um, it was what it was. It was a semi-professional theatre, meaning some actors worked in there and looked after the theatre, but also were in the play, uh, plays. Okay. They were associated with the plays. Uh, and we were just like outsiders. So I was a sales rep, so I could have a bit of time off here and there to do rehearsals. And some of the time I was in their plays, uh, Bill Pepper directed that Rose in the Ring. That was a pantomime. And, uh, of course, Bill went on to bigger things. He came down and was teacher at NIDA. Oh. Uh, he, he still coaches, I think, yeah. Wow. So he, he was pretty big. He was, a, he was a good director. And Ray, was Ray Maher in it? You know, Ray, that's where Ray Maher, you know Ray Maher from Home yeah. and Away. He, he was actually, uh, I think it was the Rose in the Ring. Yeah, I think it was. He and a couple of football mates were looking for guys, and he and a couple of football mates turned up. Uh, one went off and did something else. One liked it, but Ray was the one that really stayed in, and he started doing uh, Dimboola up there. And of course, he finished up coming south, and then we finished up in uh, um, Home and Away. Yeah, what something? I don't know how many years. I think it's thirty years or something. <laughs> oh, some silly. Yeah, good on him. It's made a fortune out of it. But he's pretty good, Ray. He's pretty good with money. He's pretty he used to work for a uh, insurance company. But I better not to tell you too much about him because you might interview him one day and yeah, love <laughs> I've told you all the story. <laughs> but he, he was great. He was top top bloke, Ray. Huh? Yeah, great guy. He used to do a lot of broadcasting for rugby union for the ABC television up there. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, because he used to play it. Yeah, good man. 
Wow. Uh, so what was your question again? <laughs> oh, well, you had, you had about the theatre, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, theatre, yeah. yeah. I, I uh, Rose of the Ring, yeah. I, I, I used to, uh, was in theatre in the round with Leboy Theatre, which is over the other suburb. And then I came over because of Bill Pepper, I think. And came over and did the Rose in the Ring. We did the Rose in the Ring. We did uh, Cauc a Caucasian Chalk Circle. Uh, there was another one, The Real Inspector Hound. And then I did Dracula. And I think it was around that time I finished up going to Mel. Oh no, I worked with all the TV stars up there. I can't think what I can't think what the name of the show uh, play was, but there's a lot of the TV stars or radio people. They're all in this play, and I was I was selected with to be in it as some character, along with another chap, we're supposed to be brothers or something. Uh, and that was exciting. And I think after that, I went, that's where I went, that's finished in 72. That's in May, then I went down to Melbourne and I moved to Melbourne. Okay. So yeah, my time there was great. Yeah, I yeah. learned a lot. Um, I always recommend people should do stage work. I mean, everyone these days, all the young fellas, all the guys and girls, all want to go and do a bit of screen acting and learn screen acting. but I reckon the basis of the whole thing is stage acting. Learn to use your voice, learn timing, rhythm, and all that, and more feeling. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah my days there were pretty good. Twelfth night, yeah. Yeah, everyone we've interviewed so far that's worked in theatre said exactly the same thing. Yeah, you know, oh, everyone should start yeah. theatre first, and oh yeah, yeah, Keep it. always theatre. You know, you, you work into an audience and all that, and you get the timing and the rhythm and the feel. Yeah. And you think more about the part. I mean, you know, with uh, sons and daughters, you don't have the time to really get too involved. You know, some of the directors do. Uh, they want to, when they first off, they ask you different things in your thought and you, and you say, well, look, really, I'm only doing this for the money. <laughs> but no, not that bad. But uh, it's a bit different, uh, art, uh, the uh, TV. Yeah. Film. Film is a little bit different. Film, you can get a bit more time to think about things. But stage is where it is. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you the art to learn lines and remember them. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I know there was, was Ray Ma, there was another one. There was four of us. What was it? The Real Inspector Hound. No, not the Real Inspector Hound. The Governor General. There were two parts to it. There's two writers. Um, Breck was one. And some other guy wrote the other one. We used to do the two of them, different styles. And uh, there was about six of us guys. We'd work together quite often. And then we'd sit on stage and wait and laugh and talk and tell jokes before the screen, before the curtains opened up. Then after the play, we used to go back in the theatre and have a few grogs, a few <laughs> beers and a few laughs. Yeah, that, that were good days. That Now I remember that was really good, really good. Yeah, different days. Thank now. you, Speaking of good days, um, let's talk about Matlock Police. You played uh, Constable Moore and Senior Constable Terry Young uh, in that series, uh, and but are best known for your role as Senior Detective Steve York from 1972 mm. to 1976. Mm. Uh, 133 episodes, in fact. Can you tell us about your characters in Matlock Police for anyone who may not have seen it? You know, that, that uh, constable guy you're talking about, that's where I met Michael Long, because Michael finished up in Sons and Daughters. Uh -huh. And that's where I met Michael. I'd worked with Michael after that a couple of times. But um, with Steve York, when I had the audition, I got the part. Um, I met uh, Rita. She was married to Gus Mercurio. And she was a producer, one of the producers. And we sat down at Crawford's and she said, what would you, know, what would you like your name to be? And I said, well, I like... Uh, I like Steve McQueen, so I think I'll go for Steve. And I said, where are you from? And she said, New York. Well, I said, I like New York too, so we'll make it Steve York. Oh, Steve. And that's it. That's how the name came about, Steve York. And uh, it was a boy's, a little boy's dream come true, you know, it's Matlock police, charging down, <laughs> riding, you know, uh, fighting and running and jumping and driving cars and all those things. So it was a blitz and we had a great time, great crew. Uh, We'd get up in the mornings over there and freezing down in Melbourne or it could be raining. Have this little caravan. We'd all sit in the caravan with a couple of three bar heater going to get warm. And then some days we'd uh, have a barbecue, which was great. Or when there was lunch called, we'd all jump in the cars and race off to the pub and have a counter lunch. 
uh, and a couple of grogs. I didn't, but I didn't have a grog there. But uh, the other boys did. And we come back and work again. So it was really a great atmosphere all the time. And lovely cast, Paul Cronin, top man, great man, Paul Cronin, uh, Vic Gordon, Michael Pate, lovely people. And all the directors were great, you know. And the directors of that, like Rod Hardy and Simon Windsor, all those guys went on to make big things in America. So, oh, so you worked with Rod on Matlock Police. Sorry? You worked with Rod Hardy on uh, Matlock Police. Yeah, like, yeah, Rod, yeah. Uh, Rod Hardy on Matlock Police and Rod Hardy on something else. But, uh, and Simon, Simon, what did Simon do? Oh, he's, he's made some big, he, he shot some big stuff in America. I think Free Willy. Uh, hmm? Free Willy. Free Willy, yeah. He did something with Tom Selleck too, that movie when Tom Selleck came out here, do that Western thing. Whatever that Quigley, was. Quigley Down yeah. Under. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lot of the guys went on to bigger and better things. I mean, went over to America. Rod's done well over there, I think. Yeah, we had Rod on not uh, recently. Oh, did you? Yeah. No, yeah, he's great. Yeah. Uh, he directed a, a few mate. episodes of uh, Prisoner as well. Yeah, well, he actually, I worked, because uh, I was on uh, Chopper Squad for a whole season, and he worked on that too. He was a director on that. Yeah, great yeah. guy. Yeah. Great. I suppose that Gary Conway never went over to America. He was pretty good. Yeah. A lot of top directors, actually. Vince Martin. Vince Martin. <clears throat> uh, Vince Martin was an actor. He worked on... Uh, and he was a, a director on Matlock Police, Vince. And then he directed a few uh, Sons and Daughters. But I think he, I don't know if he was in Sons and Daughters or not, but he's been in a few movies, you know, a few uh, TV things, shows. But he was in that thing with uh, Tom Hanks. Um, you know, when Tom Hanks was the castaway? Oh, castaway, yeah. Yeah, well, Vince was Martin that. was in that. Oh, wow. He was, he was in the plane, I think. He was co-pilot or something. Great movie. We, we shot a thing together. We shot, uh, when Deliverance came out, uh, Vince and myself got a got some kayaks and went down the Yarra River <laughs> to, to reenact Deliverance and stayed <laughs> the night and raining and in a tent that leaked. And, and the morning we got up and we were, whatever we were doing, I had my back to this guy and I didn't know the guy was coming, but he'd been killing rabbits. And Vince was in front of me and he started laughing and I turned around and got a hell of a fright. And here's this guy with rabbits hanging down his side, all skinned and everything. So it's nearly deliverance all over again for me. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. I mean, he, 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 we went over to America and he does a lot of singing, I think. Over there. So there's a lot of people that have been through the different areas that yeah. have gone on to success. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, Crawford Productions before. Did you ever meet... Oh, hang on, I've, I've taken Ken's question, but that's okay. He won't mind. Um, did you ever meet Hector before? Hector Crawford? Oh, yeah. Yeah, me, I met Hector a few times. Uh, Hector and his... Uh, what was his nephew, I think? I can't think of his name. The other, other Crawford. Then there was Henry Crawford. He was related to them. Henry is actually... Uh, what was he? Editor or producer of, uh, of Matlock. Yeah. But Hector, yeah, I never met his sister. I think she's always a bit sickly, I think. But Hector was a great old guy. He'd had a Christmas uh, meal or whatever, Christmas party. Yeah. With people in the shows and they'd come together. Not that I went up and had a great talk to him, but yeah, he was there, accepting for what he was. Yeah, he's great. To get all those things happening for Australia, really good. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Sorry, Ken. Should I, should I pinch your question now about Sid Connor Beer? Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> he, he played your father, uh, Tom, in Sons and Daughters. Yeah. He had several guest roles in Matlock Police as well. Did you know him before that? No, I met him in Matlock Police. And also his daughter. I'm trying to think of her name. She's a good actress. She worked a few times in Matlock Police. But Sid, I knew him from Matlock, and then he came in as my father. Yeah, so it was just a working relationship with Sid. Lovely fella. So was his daughter. I can't think what her name was now. You know, you're talking about people starting off. Uh, Sigrid Thornton, I think her first TV appearance was Matlock Police. Oh. Um, I think she may have been in a wheelchair, the character. And then Noni Hazelhurst, her first appearance was in Matlock Police. And she was a young girl. I can remember her riding a pushbike. But then the, the, the naughty man at that time 
got her and raped her and killed her, I think. Oh, but, you know, that's how they started off. It's yeah, good when you see that. Yeah. Yeah, Nani. Yeah, she got on a bigger and better thing. Yeah. Definitely. Can you share some memories with us <laughs> of working with the late Paul Cronin, who played senior constable Gary Hogan? Yeah, top man. He and Michael Pate got together, I think, and had these houseboats. They were making houseboats. I don't know if they really eventuated anything good, but Paul and his wife, Helen, and his daughters were always lovely. He'd go there. And when I actually, I think when, yeah, when Matlock finished, Paul, God bless him, and I was looking around for work and different things, he actually got me to come up and paint the ceilings in his house, <laughs> in the <laughs> living room, the dining room and all that. <laughs> and uh, and paid me, and I didn't want it, but he paid me. And then I was doing um, speed painting or artwork uh, at markets, and uh, I painted one thing. And Helen got it off me for twenty dollars. He bought it for twenty dollars. And I spoke to their daughter, uh, Jules, Julia, Julie, uh, and she said, and we're talking about it. And she said, Yeah, I've still got that. It's in the car. It's in a cargo thing at the back, where in the warehouse, wherever. I said, really? Your mother kept it? And she said, yeah. But that, they, they were lovely people, Cronin was, because he, he used to drive trucks and everything, right around them, whoop, whoop, up north and the whole bit. Oh, wow. Top, top man, yeah, top people. Yeah, great actor. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to remember this episode of Matlock Police, but it was called uh, In the Name of the Queen in 1974, but it also starred George Lazenby, who, of course, was the second bond do you remember working with george in that episode yeah i didn't have much, uh, paul more or less i worked with him but paul more or less got involved more with him his character yeah and i, I went with our friends i'm not quite sure um uh, but yeah paul worked with him most of all but yeah we, we did uh yeah i didn't have much to do with him actually i think i met him a couple of times on set or on location but i guess i can't recall i know the show you're talking about actually but yeah, he, he's pretty friendly. Yeah. You played. I'll tell you something about James Bond in a minute. But anyway, uh, yeah, I met George. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, you played know? Richard Braddock in the Sullivans in 1977. And I, I, I actually freelanced on a few of those. What was it like being in that show? I, I actually, I watched a clip of that and I didn't know I had that much. Like when I was talking to the, a group of soldiers about what we we're going to do or attack. I don't know why I, thought, I didn't I don't remember that. I do remember talking to uh, Norman Yem because Norman and I had a couple of scenes together in that. But when I saw someone put the clip up and I thought, God, did I do all that in there? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I don't remember too much about it. It was one of those jobs you get and you think, yep, off we go, you do it. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Hasta la vista, baby. And off I went. Yeah. <laughs> so, can did you have to actually audition for that part? And, and can you tell us anything further about the show and your character for anyone who may not have seen it? What's that? Is that Sullivan's? Sullivan's. Yeah. No, I don't recall auditioning. I think I just got it. Um, a lot of shows like that. It's like when I first started down there, I, I did the audition, first off, and there was some unknown reason. I didn't, I, I didn't know about it. you had to go and do auditions. I was just getting um, parts in Division Four and, and Matlock again and Homicide and all that, and uh, and with Sullivan's, I I think I just got called up and I said, yeah, okay. I, I really can't remember doing any auditions like that. Yeah. The only auditions I remember was the first one I did when I went down there, and the second one was when I did it for Matlock Police. Are you an actor yeah. that likes to do auditions, or you don't you don't like auditions? Oh, it doesn't really matter to me. I yeah. don't care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you go along, you know, it's like more or less cattle calls. Everyone goes along. Yeah. You just do it, you know, the director says something you want to do, and yeah, okay, ad lib, you know, whatever, improvise. Yeah. No, nah, it doesn't really matter. That's part of, part of the job. I don't, I, never, I don't think I've ever worried about it, really. Even my, when I went down to Melbourne, um, going there and doing that audition, I knew my lines because I was acting at the time and stage. Yeah. When Long did it and said, see you later. And Loretta Healy ran out and said, when are you coming down? I said, oh, yeah, such as that. And I wasn't the least concerned. <laughs> and off I went because I didn't know. If she said something like that, I thought, oh, I'll come down early. But she didn't say that. I found out later on. 
And it's funny, you know, a little, a little uh, a bit of trivia stuff. We had a, uh, a Christmas party at Big Gordon's place and Paul and I were mucking around on the floor fighting and you know, having a go at each other or whatever. And Loretta Healy was sitting at the party and I'm sure as she told me or someone said, she saw, looked at Paul and she could see that Mr. What, his, what was his name? Whatever his name was in the Sullivans, but she saw him as the Sullivan man. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sure she told me because we're pretty friendly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's how I thought that was great. Pity she didn't see something else in me at the time. But <laughs> <laughs> she saw that in Paul. So all those little things. Good idea. They're saying all this. They only got to write a book. God, yeah. blimey. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> Yeah. Now I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip a few questions because I just want to be uh, courtesy of your time. Um, so we'll move to sons and daughters. But just before we get to sons and daughters, I just want to ask one of Ken's questions. Were you a fan of Prisoner at the time? Did you watch Prisoner? No, I didn't. But I knew some of the girls around there because uh, I think they were shooting Prisoner. I think they were shooting Prisoner when we were doing Matlock Police. I think. So they were in one, well, they were in one studio, and we're in the other, and, and you'd see them. Yeah, but I, I don't think I watched it too much. No, sorry. I'd like to say yes, I did occasionally, but not all the time. No. The only show I watched was like Matlock. I used to like Homicide. I thought Homicide had a great feel to it. You know, yeah. but you guys must like Prisoner. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say yeah, I love it. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, so you love it, please. No. <laughs> love it. Well, well, I know the act, some of the actors in it. Uh, no, great. You know, yeah. Maggie Kilpatrick, what a woman, lover, yeah. great, wonderful person. And a few of the others, I just can't place their names right now, but they were. I worked with them in in Matlock, and all lovely actors. Yeah. 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 Um, now, Sons and Daughters, which, of course, what is why we're here, started in 1982, ended in 1987 with a total of 972 episodes. You're in it from episode one in 1982 to 1986 and then returning in 1987 for the end of the series. So how did you get the role of David Palmer? Well, there's a man, the producer, executive producer at the time, Don Batty. I worked with Don in Melbourne on the box. And he was tied up with Matlock. And then he came to work with Grundy's and then I came up. And a lot of the shows I've been in, Don Batty was more or less always the producer. And uh, then I came up to do a few things up here. Mm. And then I think John Orzik was down to do Chopper Squad and he couldn't do it because he's doing Cop Shop. And then Don Batty got me into Chopper Squad. And then I came out of Chopper Squad and I was doing Bellamy because uh, I knew a lot of the guys there. I got into Bellamy. And at that time, Don asked me to come and audition. I didn't know what I was auditioning for. I went and auditioned. And I finished up in Sons and Daughters. But Don ba Batty had been a big influence on my career, actually. I don't know why. But he used to put me in a lot of things. He put me in Boney, got me in Boney as the, as the cop. And it was a pity he said we could have kept you going in Boney. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I got in, really, just another audition but after being a lot of uh, tied up with Grundy's a lot doing other shows yeah. yeah Sons and Daughters was created by Reg Watson who mm -hmm. we know created many TV shows including Prisoner did you meet Reg at all and do you know how long he stayed with the show I think he was always in the background I met him a couple of times I did you know when you're doing the show you really don't meet too many people you know when you don't meet you meet some of the writers, Bevan Lee, I met a few times, and uh, Reg, I didn't, I don't, I met him a couple of times, but I know how well known he is in England and also here in Australia. Yeah. So he was very uh, a mainstay in, in, in TV and series here in Australia. But uh, so I didn't have much to do with Reg, but he was pretty good. Now, Don Batty and Peter Pinney, uh, who was, a, I think, assistant producer or whatever he was. They were the ones that put the uh, song together. They wrote the words oh. and the whole thing. And uh, you yeah, got there, the, where the singer is. She, she, uh, she put the, the voice to it, but they actually wrote the words to it. It's become such a huge song, the Sons and Daughters theme song, hasn't it? It's like, yeah. like the Neighbours theme song just recently, you know, going on uh, the, the, the top one iTunes song now, the, the original theme song. Oh, really? 
Yeah, because they're all you know, obviously they're axing neighbors, so they're all trying to save it. So the song's just gone straight to the top with Barry Crocker. And <laughs> what are your thoughts on the axing of neighbors? What 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 do you what do you think about that? Neighbors? Yeah. Oh, I don't mind. I mean, neighbors, of course, was um, a Channel Seven show, I think. Then it was axed. Channel Ten picked it up and went to Melbourne. But yeah, no, I mean they had they had the lovely. Um, What's it called? I can't think. She was in, in, in. I know her so well. I can't think of her. Um, she played Rosie or something in in Sons and Daughters. Called Anne Hattie. Anne yeah, lovely Anne Hattie. Yeah, top bird. And a few of the others in it. You know, and then Ian Rawlings and all him. So yeah, it's done well. That, that those type of shows I I watch occasionally. You know, like home and away. I sit and uh, watch it a little bit. But I got a lot of friends. You know, yeah. young girl at the health shop. She watches home and away and said, "Oh, Tom." You were in Home and Away because she's a big fan. They said, yeah, she leaves here early to run home and watch Home and Away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's quite funny. But, uh, yeah, Home and Away. The, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less, I go to the streaming channels, like a bit of action, a bit of drama, a bit of crime. Yeah. But they're all good. I mean, they're great. I mean, I've been in them and they give a lot of actors work. Yeah. That's the main thing. We don't get enough of those type of shows in Australia. They're more reality tv as long as they produce the uh the enough australian uh, content which is a pity actually yeah there's a lot of people out there well they say just, I yeah. acting in tv um it was hard but now if you come into acting now you have to more or less sing dance act the whole thing yeah. <laughs> keep yourself working really yeah uh, yep Ken. Matt? To me, uh, yes, it is oh, you. Sorry, it is, yes, sorry. So, when you got the part of David, did you get a uh, character breakdown of of that part when you took it on? Oh, I could have, but he was married, I suppose. I, I just can't remember that, but I just made it up anyway. You know, <laughs> because my brother was a truck driver, I said, "Yeah, driving trucks, yeah, he's a bit rough around the edges, type of thing." And good old knockabout Aussie guy. So, he wasn't too far from me, actually. <laughs> was that your idea to have the blue singlet on a few times in the no, that was wardrobe actually oh, wardrobe I think the, the old flannelette shirt we used to love that's a little bloody flannelette shirt again <laughs> gold so you'd put it on you wouldn't worry just use it because that was a style and you look around you see a lot of guys wearing flannelette shirts you know, and the laborers and different things so yeah and truckies yeah I, I suppose it was a cheaper cheaper outfit to put, yeah. to put someone in but no uh, old David <laughs> it'll be a though when I used to drink everyone thought I was a real drinker but I've told them lately over the time I never drank the beer I just put oh, my head it off put it up in my mouth made out I did and I'd give it to the crew oh wow I never drank I never had a drop but I think at that stage I'd actually oh no I didn't give up I wasn't I, I, I'm not a great I don't drink anymore but I uh, at that time I don't think I was drinking I was drinking a bit of wine but no beer but, and when you're doing acting, I don't want to drink anyway. So yeah. I did a commercial years ago, Forex one up in Queensland before I went anywhere, did a commercial up there. It was a Forex and we were drinking it. And I finished up at half when I had to drive home. And then I did a Ryan and they thought I was, because I did something and Ryan, Rod Mulliner was bashing the hell out of me. And Gary Conway uh, thought I was a stuntman. So they got me into standing for Rod. You know, and I jumped off a boat in Port Phillip Bay, freezing cold, came out, and uh, I started drinking whiskey and a bit of brandy or whatever, and I finished half cocked there too. So, you know, I thought, no, I won't drink any, anything when I'm acting. No. That was funny, that, that, that thing with Ryan. I came out, and, and Gary Conway, when I found out later on, he thought I was a stuntman. And uh, they said, we want you to come out, jump, over and fall into the ocean, you know, fall in, in, in Port Phillip Bay. I said, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. And, yeah, and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to come out this door and there was a pipe near the railing and near the, on, the, on the boat. And I said, well, I'll put my foot on that and I'll jump over. Oh, good, good. So they said, okay, action. I ran out, missed the pipe, <laughs> did a cartwheel over the <laughs> side and finished up with the water. Uh, but he said it was good, so I didn't worry about it. But it must have been terrible. I didn't see it, but it must look funny. 
running out and missing a pipe and doing all this as I was going to do what I, what I was going to do. He never did it at all. That was, that was fun. I got to write a book. <laughs> Sons and Daughters was a brand new series for Channel 7, so you were all starting at the same time. What are your memories of what it was like to be part of that and what was the atmosphere like amongst the cast? Oh, it was a great atmosphere, a top atmosphere from day one. We had all the young people in it, like Stephen and Antonia and Ali, because she was in Watusis, I think, at the time. Peter Phelps, he was, he'd been working on other things for Grundy's. And then the lovely Pat McDonald. I had met Pat because she was in 96 when we were doing Matlock, like we'd meet occasionally, but never really got involved too much with her. Rowie I had met because she'd been doing Crawford's things, but not, not you know, didn't know her that well. Um, and Brian Blaine, I met Brian when I was in Queensland working for Paramount Pictures, and he was in a uh, Charlie's Art, it was a theatre restaurant play, and we went along one night from Paramount, and we're there and uh, met all the cast from there. And I met Brian, and later on, uh, I said, I'll give you a lift home. So I gave him a lift home to West End and came and left him there. And then all those years later, I met him again in Sons and Daughters. Wow. And uh, we spoke about it. I don't know if he remembered me, but I remembered him because of the Charlie's Arm play. Yeah. Can we, can we just talk a minute about Brian? Because you, there's not a lot of information. Of course, he, you know, he passed away at the age of 54. Mm. He played uh, Gordon Hamilton. But can you tell us a bit about him? There's not a lot of uh, you know, interviews or anything that you can sort of learn about him. But it, he was an amazing actor and he was brilliant on Sons. Oh, look, the character on Sons and Daughters, that Gordon Hamilton, was nothing like Brian Blake. Oh, it wasn't? Brian, oh, God, no, nothing like that at all. Brian was always very happy, always laughing, always. And then he's a bit stooped over, but he's always laughing and walking around. And he actually, uh, he's told me a story that he was went to an acting class and the teachers asked him to come along and he had all his biog there and, he showed, and the teacher showed the students. He was actually in 600 stage plays. Really? 600 stage plays. Uh, and he was a top bloke. And I, he used to live in, uh, his mum lived in the Nango and I had a bit of property up there. So I, I don't know if I ever gave him a lift there, but I saw him around a couple of times. Um, but he, was, he lived in, um, around Leichhardt and he had this very thin house. And what he, and Stephen Comey said the other week, he said what he did, he didn't want to finish paying it off and he only had a small amount on it. So he tied up with a bag that he'd pay something like a couple of shillings a week. <laughs> <laughs> to pay off the loan so he'd keep it going. But what he did, he pulled up the whole floor to redo it. And I don't know if he ever got to finish it off or not. I don't know. But he <laughs> said he used to go in there and have to step over stuff because the floor wasn't there. He's a great character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he's just good. But the character of Gordon Hamlet was nothing, nothing whatsoever like oh. Brian Blaine. It's quite amazing, the transformation. Yeah. But yeah, no, he's good. And him and, uh, him, him and Ian Rawlings had some great scenes together. Yeah, another cut. Yeah, another. Look, I tell you, the cast, we used to have this thing. Uh, you might have heard about it now. But we used to have the award. Um, it was the P, you know, da, 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 Willie of the Week, I'll say, instead of saying the, the right word. You can say whatever you like here. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it was called the Prick of the Week. Prick of the okay. Week. <laughs> prick of the Week. Every Wednesday night, Prick of the Week. Every Wednesday night when they finished, it was a couple of slabs of beer and they'd nominate the pick of the week. Now you could do good things or bad things and suddenly you'd be pick of the week. You know, everyone tried to get it. Uh, I think Leela got it. I think Rowie had it a couple of times. And I think it got a plaque. It was on the wall. Who won pick of the week? And you get this, uh, this statue type thing, whatever it was, I forget now. You'd be presented with that. And it was yours for a week. And it was a great, great atmosphere. Really tops. Anyone could get it. Wardrobe. Camera guys, anyone. So, so what do you have to do to become a prick for a week? Anything. Anything. Nothing, nothing spectacular. I don't know what it was now. You might have made a mistake or did something. Oh, he's a bit of a prick. Yeah. Or if something good. <laughs> oh, what a prick he is. So all the women and got the prick of the week. Anyone. So it was good. But everyone wanted to get the prick of the week. It was like those end titles. You know those end titles, a freeze frame? Everyone was trying to get a freeze frame. <laughs> 
That oh. reminds me a bit of Bob Mallion at Channel 7. He used to have a thing called the Crown Award. Um, and Bob and I were involved in that. And it was a bit like that sort of thing. All right. Bobby Mallion, there's a director. I worked with him, you know. I worked yeah. with the cameraman. And then as a director, when he worked for the ABC. Yeah. I don't know what show it was, the ABC, some show that I was in. And he was a camera, he was a director. He's passed away too, didn't he? Yes, he did. He was uh, actually my best man at oh, my wedding. Was and I was his best man at his wedding. Because he married the publicity lady from Channel 10. Yes, yes, that's right. Hmm. I Sorry. can't think of her name. She was tops. Gail. Gail, that's Gail, it. That's Gail Barley. Yeah. 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 Because he was Bob Mal um what's his name? John, John's John John brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, he I could tell you. A few. Either, did he? he didn't worry too much about all that. And he never mentioned I only found out from someone else. Yeah. No, he, when I first met him down at Channel 7, Bob, um, I didn't know that his his brother was John Mellion either. Um, no. It took me a long time to find that out. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't worry about it. Uh, no. Did you really realise that at the time when you were shooting Sons and Daughters that it would be so popular so many years later? Oh, not really. Uh, I guess when you're doing it, you don't think of it, you know. It's... <laughs> if we knew it was going to be that popular, we would have signed up to get digital real royalties. <laughs> we did it. Uh... What's the name from prisoner? Did she was lucky, she had a good agent, but we never signed oh, up for it. Right, yeah. <laughs> no? Bell Lane, yeah, yeah, yeah. good honor, whack a eh? good stuff, <laughs> but yeah, no, we didn't sign up for that, no, didn't sign up for anything. But Sons and Daughters, we uh, there was a chap, Vic, Vic Dennis, he came from Belgium and he worked for a, a magazine called Dag Alamal. And he came over, he teamed up with me. I haven't got on me, I don't know. But he came over and we're talking about it and we got all the, some of the cast together and he's taking photos and got stories and all that. And he liked it so much that he went back to Belgium and convinced the mob from Dag Alamal that he should get some actors over to Belgium. Awesome. So we got myself, Stephen Comey and Pat McDonald and another friend of his lined up all the airfares and all the accommodation. And we went out and uh, we landed there in Belgium and then the first thing was this uh, Mercedes-Benz dealer who put money in for us to come over. And we went into his uh, car sale place and there was about four people when we walked in. We went upstairs and had a cup of tea and we came back and there were still four people. <laughs> they gave Pat some flowers and we're about to, we were leaving. We said to Vic, I, he said, this is terrible, isn't it? Only four people. <laughs> he said, yeah. Anyway, he said, we'll keep going. And we drove down to the town and there was in the town, the shops there, there were these thousands of people uh, near this shop. We thought, what in the hell is happening there? He said, I don't know. So we pulled up, but they're there, there for us. All oh. these people in Belgium. It was just amazing. We were oh. blown away. We were just blown away with it. And had their police, they put them aside and put us into the, uh, this man's, uh, let me see, Spens dealer's daughter's boutique. And the whole idea was, because they didn't think it was going to be that big, People would come in and see us, have a photo, we sign an autograph. Well, I had to lock the door. Now I pushed it in the window. The window was going in like that. And we couldn't. We sat there for a while. And then we came out and they were all over us. And we were saying, oh, hello, hello. And the police escorted us out and got go we got us going with the police escort. And then this went on all the time. And there was one place, a shop in Ghent. We were there and it was just packed. And people came up to us and going, but what happened was when we left, they all rushed us, and I'm knocking uh, displays over and knocking all the stuff off. But mate, it was just, and then in Antwerp, there were so many people that, you know, I thought there were 20,000, maybe not, maybe a bit over the top, but it just blocked everything. They blocked our cars. We were in three, two cars and they were giving us babies to hold and kissing us and pulling at us. So it was a really amazing adventure. And some of those people today, and our friends on Facebook all those years later. So we're friends. Wow. They send cards and we talk and yeah, go on. They're lovely people. But we went, I went over three times. And now I think Brian went, Sarah went, Leela, Ian, 
and uh, his wife and Leela and her daughter and Danny Roberts. Danny Roberts, we went somewhere and there were so many people, Danny thought it was the Beatles coming. <laughs> it was actually us. It was for you guys. So things like that, you, know, you never thought that would happen. Yeah. Uh, and the same in England when we used to go over there. People would pull you aside and recognise you. Pull your sunglasses off or something. Not that I was hiding. But people would recognise you. It was quite, it was quite nice. Quite nice, really. It was good fun. It's funny, though. A lot of these amazing shows like Sons and Prisoner and all the other shows rate better over in, you know, some other countries than they do in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Sons and Daughters, I think, rated well because what they tried to do, shows that used to be made in Sydney wouldn't rate too well in Melbourne. And I think shows in Melbourne wouldn't rate too well in Sydney. So that's why they said in Melbourne, they combined the two of them. Uh, so, and that helped, I think. Yeah, that yeah. helped. Yeah. Being made, we'd go down there once or twice a month or something, shoot all the outdoor stuff and then come back yeah. and then do all the stuff up here. Now, I think that helped. It. That's what they were trying to do, I think. Make them in both towns so they both got a good feel for each. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you ever watch it when you were on it? Did you like to sort of watch yourself? or, or you just... Oh, yeah, I don't mind. I just watch it. I, I, I really, I, it doesn't really bother me. I think, oh, I could have done that bit better. Or I'll watch it. I watch it the other, because it's on now, get on Channel 7, I think. And I watched it when I was yelling at uh, Peter Phelps. <laughs> I thought, God, that just sounds like me yelling at my son once, a time. <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't mind watching things. I don't mind watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matlock Police, I used to watch. I've got the series here, and I, I'll put a put a show on. So I used to like that. I used to like that. Yeah. And I like Sons and Daughters too. Yeah. Do you have a uh, favourite storyline that David was involved in over the years? Storyline for David? No. Um, I liked this. It was great working with Leela Hayes. You know. The, the story there was um, Leona Rogers, or Rogers, I think it was. It was good working with her. That was a good storyline. Um, I liked the storyline where she, Rowena told me I wasn't the twins, I uh, wasn't the father. <laughs> but I liked working with Leela Hayes. She was quite good to work with. You know, you do your rehearsals and all that and your moves, and something might just happen. You might change a bit when you're doing the take or something like that. Yeah. But she would do it and she'd work with you too. So she was very good. And the same with Rowie. Rowie was good to work with, you know. Yeah, she had a lot of strength and everything. She told me once she was nervous working with me, but little did she know I was nervous. <laughs> well, <Working laughs> yeah. I, I don't know why she was nervous with me. We're well, good. Yeah. No, yeah. You still speak Other to Leela, or huh? You still speak to Leela, or I haven't. No, we did a play. We did an Imbula theatre play years ago, and uh, and she just dropped out of the scene. We we're talking about it the other day. And uh, no, I haven't spoken to Lula. Yeah. But it's always good. She, I did that DVD about sons and daughters and asked her, and she, and she was willing. I went up there and spoke to her and interviewed her on the, for the DVD. Uh, top bird, top lady. Yeah, she was good. I think she ran for politics, didn't get in, but um, okay. she was a bit upset that we never got any royalties, too, I suppose, or any fees from the reruns. Yeah. But I guess that's life. Don't worry about it. Just move on. Yeah. That's not the good will come. Somewhere. Yeah, our, our producer uh, Jan remembers a particular episode in which Beryl, Beryl's next door neighbour, teenager Jeff O'Brien, who had become an alcoholic after an accident and after killing his best friend Luke Carlisle, decided to run away from home and whilst drinking at the O'Brien home, he writes a note for his family but leaves it on the cooker, which is switched on, setting fire to the kitchen and he is subsequently killed in the resulting explosion. Jeff's mother, Heather, returns home as the house is on fire and raises the alarm. David, Jeff's father, Mike, and his uncle Jim all go into the house to attempt to rescue Jeff, but are too late and have to return to Beryl to tell her, Heather, that, that he was in there and that he's passed away. What are your memories of filming that episode and working with the actors who played the O'Brien family. Yeah, I uh, love it. Yeah, Kenny. Yeah, Ken James. Yeah, top man. Yeah, good fun. Um, and uh, I forget the other lady's name because I interviewed her too. That was uh, that was a big fire in the house, wasn't it? We went into the fire. 
Yeah. They had, they had that in the studio and uh, had fire, the firemen there, a fire brigade all there watching it happen. And it was damn hot working, walking close to all those flames, all controlled. But it was so bad that the uh, Channel 7 banned any more fires in the studio because oh. it could have set the whole place alight. It was, you know, those, those, it was damn hot walking past them. Yeah. And they had them you know, on the side and the whole thing was controlled, but you wouldn't have thought so when you're walking through it. It was pretty well, pretty well presented, well controlled, but it was too dangerous. I think Channel 7 stopped all that. And uh, the young lad in that, that was Lucky Star's son. Really? Yeah. He's a, I think he's in now in America singing, doing singing over in America. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was Lucky Star's young lad doing that. Wow. But all that was more or less, mm, that was more or less, yeah, that's soap opera stuff when I think it killed him. <laughs> all that, yeah. No more fires. That fire, though, that was pretty, pretty heavy, that fire. Yeah, it was a big one. Um, now, we spoke about Brian Blaine just before. Now, also, yeah. Cornelia Francis, who's no longer with us. What was it like working with her? Mate? Oh, top. Worked with her. Worked with her many times. I think I worked with her in the box. I'm not quite sure. But I know I worked with her in a couple of shows. Yeah, nothing like nothing like she always portrayed. Yeah. She always came across so strong and that. Very gentle person. Yeah, very kind. Yeah. Oh. Lovely. I don't have any great memories, but I know when I used to talk to her and all that, yeah. she was very... And I think Stephen Comey visited her a few times when she was in hospital before she passed away. Okay. But top burden, yeah. yeah. And I'm saying they're all good, but they were good, you know? Yeah. You can't say that was a... Oh, she was a horrible person because they weren't. They were just ordinary people doing a job and all friendly. Yeah. And they're Ooh. damn good actors. They're only good actors. And uh, when you work with them, you got a lot more from them. That was really good. Like Pat yeah. McDonald's great, you know, yeah. all them, and all the young ones, Topsy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Was there anything that you didn't like about David Palmer? Yeah, he wore flannel and shirts. He's a good bloke. No, he's all right. No. Yeah. I don't know why he got so mixed up with, you know, one minute barrel, next minute, uh, next minute, what's the name? Pat. <laughs> that. And then he, I think he had a bit of a fling, fling with her sister. Uh, yeah, he, I think he thought he was a bit of a ladies' man, but he wasn't. He didn't well, seem to do too well any of that. That's uh, Ken's next question. We covered Willie of the week, so I'll move to uh, Ken. Which which of the women in his in his life do you think he was best suited to, and who would you personally have liked him to end up with? Well, I think really of what he was and who he was, I think Beryl was yeah. the type of person that he should be, be with. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I think actually what he should have done was just get in his truck and drive around and have a good fun <laughs> life <laughs> and not worry about too many women because the women <laughs> in his life didn't help at all. Yeah. But I, he should have finished up with Rowena's. Well, he could have finished up with a second Pat the Rat, Belinda. She's oh, a top. Belinda, yeah. Yeah, could have finished up with her, or could he? She could have. He could have finished up with uh, Pat the Rat's sister, yeah. Leona Leona Rogers, I think it was English actress. But she was a lovely person. That's yeah, funny. Her, it's been interesting when we announced your interview. I had a few of my friends send me messages going, "Oh my God, you're interviewing Tom Richards." My mum loved him when you know, back when Sons was on. So did you, did you get a lot of attention from the public, from ladies when you're on Sons of Daughters? You know, David Palmer, the long hair and the, you know. Yeah. No, I, did. I don't remember that. No, I don't. The only thing I really remember is when we go somewhere, people would come up. But the thing that really stuck, it sticks in my mind, is the thing in Belgium. Yeah. You know? I mean, I made a record over there and all that. It was a Palander. Well, I didn't see it. I used to speak it. They wanted me to do that and I did that. Uh, and riding a horse and fell off the friggin' thing, uh, trying to help uh, Gay Tan, who the young girl that the video was. Uh, yeah, so no, no. But in Matlock Police, I, I was one of the first actors to have a fan club. Uh, and then the fans got really, <laughs> they want you to be here. You've got to be here. They're having a lunch. We want you here. You know? and, and they're all good, though. they're all friendly. So, yeah, I used to send them information every month of what we were doing and what we weren't doing. 
and they'd pull out a uh, a little newsletter. She'd type up a newsletter and send it out. And then now, with sons and daughters, I have a friend in England, uh, Sal Lovell. She comes out a lot because she has a partner out here. She was tied up with the fan club. She started a fan club in England. And Darren Gray, he's with, I think he's with Neighbours. Well, young doctors too. Young doctors, yeah, Darren, yeah. Yeah, Darren, yeah. But he, he was very good to me too. He was over here and got very friendly and we did a lot of things together. Right. And then over there in England, I met him in, in uh, a few years back. And that's where I met up with Cell. And she came out here and met up with a fellow called John down in Melbourne. And she's very friendly with a lot of the neighbours cast. Yeah. When she comes out, she meets them for coffee or dinner or lunch or something. Oh, wow. He's all good. Yeah, we're all friendly. Yeah. yeah. Where um, do you guys where do you guys live? I'm in Keysborough, Melbourne. You where? Keysborough. You're in Melbourne? Yeah. You're both in Melbourne? Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, I see you on Facebook. You're in Sydney. You got, a lovely, you, got, you got a lovely little daughter or son, haven't you met? Daughter, yeah. 10 years old. Yeah. Grace. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. She keeps me busy. She's probably you too. <laughs> <laughs> We'll turn it around. Um, yeah. Now, we we're just talking about David Palmer, how he had a uh, fiery temper. Did you find that easy to play at the time or hard? Nah, pretty easy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I look like I'm friendly and relaxed, but I can change very quickly and get a bit <laughs> like anyone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fiery temper. Ask my son, he'll tell you. <laughs> Had... Not all the time, no, not all the time. I'm getting too old now to worry about things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> David had five children, or so we originally thought at least. It transpired that the twins with Patricia, John and Angela weren't his after all. So his biological children were Kevin, Susan and Robert, who he had with Beryl, and Lee, who was the daughter he had with his brother's wife, Franny. David found it hard to connect with his children. What was it like playing that? Well, firstly, that's a shock to me. <laughs> I didn't know I had that, all that. I didn't know about all that. That's quite amazing. Hey, where'd you get that from? I don't know. I knew, I knew the twins weren't supposed to be mine. Yeah. I don't know how that came about. That one weren't supposed to be mine after what we went through. I thought Lee, yeah, I remember Lee. That's right. I remember Lee, but I don't know about that, that story. That was young. Uh, what's the name that played that part? I know I had Kevin and Susan, but I don't know about the other ones. That's a shock to me. You tell me that. Well, Lee was played by uh, Lisa. Lisa. Crittenden. Crittenden. Yeah. Who yeah, was long known as Maxine Daniels in Prisoner. So, yeah, what was it like working with her? Oh, she's good. Uh, lovely girl. Yeah, very friendly. Warm. Yeah. She had to, when she left. I think she left and went somewhere else. I don't know what she was in. But I, I know I keep saying they're all nice. They all are really nice people. Yeah. I don't think I have a bad word with anyone. I think Lisa and I had a bit of a tiff one day for some reason. I have no idea. Uh, there wasn't much. That's about the only thing I remember. But, you know, she was lovely. You always give her a hug. And Oriana, Oriana Fasana, she's great. She played Susan. She's funny. She's really funny. Yeah. Yeah. Still been, she's on Facebook, still in touch with her. Yeah. Not good. Mm. All good. Can you, tell, all good. can you tell us <laughs> yes. why, you, why you actually left Sons and Daughters uh, in 1986 and then you were back for the last episode in 1987, which was episode 972? It's funny because I think... I went to America and came back and then a, a director or producer got in touch with me and wanted me to be in this movie. And that was going to happen in October, I think. And I said, well, yeah, the contract was up and I left. Then the movie fell through. He couldn't get the money. And I said to them, I think I said to Peter Pinney or someone, so they're going to write me back in again. And then he said, I've got the money. <laughs> Let's go. And I said, okay, I'll forget about that. I'm going to the movie. And suddenly he didn't have the money. Oh. So I said, forget it. So I stayed out. And then when they came back to the end, they wanted me to come back. 
to do that last thing with uh, Melinda. Yeah, so that's basically it. That was Stupid. It. Yeah. Don't believe anyone until you see the money, mate. <laughs> <You know, laughs> it stayed on. Yeah. But then it finished anyway. I think, you know, whatever ran, it was a good run. Otherwise, I think they start getting a bit too silly. I mean, I know Home and Away is wonderful and all that, and a new audience are watching it. But I watched it the other... It seems to have disappeared or gone away, well away from how it started. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know it's a home for fostering children or something and all that. But that seems to have fizzled out. You know. But still, I don't think they pay to get it made. It all comes back from overseas. Keeps people work. Keeps, keeps the TV industry going. Yeah. Now, they, um, they remade Prisoner with Wentworth, with Foxtel. Do you think they'll ever do a remake of Sons and Daughters? Ah, oh, I don't think so. They might, you know. They get some of the old ones back. I'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I don't think they will. I don't think they will make another one. Yeah, I mean, there's more storylines out there that could make a different things. Yeah, I think it's good to have it where it is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Forty years is pretty good, and the and the reaction it's got from people everywhere. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, leave it while it was hot. I mean, I think, I don't know, it's a true story, but I think Channel 7 got away, got rid of it and to make their own home and away. Ah, Otherwise, okay. Because it was raining, raining well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we want to be uh, courteous of your time, and um, we've got a few more questions, but we might move to the fan questions, Ken, just so we... Uh... Yeah, keep going. You're all right. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what the time is anyway. Uh, oh, that'd be right. It's okay. It only take me a bit over half an hour to get there. It's all right. Okay. Okay. Um, did you have any favourite writers or directors on the show? No. No, no. There's some new ones. Mark Piper was good. Uh, he was a good fella. And uh, I'm trying to think of a name. She was new. She came on. She was good. Um, no, they're all pretty good. They're all pretty friendly, all pretty open up. Uh, yeah. Peter Andrew Kiedis who's gone on for bigger and better things in Australia here, movies and different things. He cut his teeth on Sons and Daughters, came out of school and uh, was working on Sons and Daughters. Uh, no, I, I don't have particularly one in mind. I just found them all very friendly. Yeah. They're all good to work with. Same with producers. Rosie, she was good. She made uh, that uh, country, that uh, Western thing, uh, whatever that was, uh, McLeod's Daughters, she made that. Oh, McLeod's, yeah. Yeah. Mm, she was she was our producer. John, um, what's John's last name? He was a producer upstairs. He was good. He I think he became something else important in in, uh, in uh, Channel 7. I can't think what he was now. But yeah, everyone was pretty good. You know, whether I was walking around with my head in a cloud, I have no idea, but I didn't find anything nasty in anyone. Whatever they said behind your back, they said it, but they didn't show face to face. They were all pretty good. Mm. That's good. Can you run us through a typical day of shooting sons and daughters? Were they long days? No, it could be. Location wasn't too bad because you'd probably only do a three or four scenes. Early starts, of course, on location, as you would be aware of. Uh, and early starts in the, in, in the studio. I think we had like, I think it was, I'm not quite sure. I'm probably getting mixed up with shows. Probably Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday might have been location stuff. Or any actor, guest actors would be shot during the first part of the week. And then we'd be doing uh, rehearsals, studio rehearsals. And then in the latter part, we'd be doing studio. So it was, they were fairly long. But if you weren't in the scene, we had our own little caravan outside. We'd go back and hang around there or just do things. Yeah. I can't, I, I can't say it never really bothered me, you know, even, even in all the shows I've been in, Chopper Squad and all that. In Chopper Squad, you'd sit around and play cards not all day <laughs> and smoke too much. And some of they call you, jump in a boat and race around the ocean or jump in the ocean for a helicopter to pick you up or pick up someone. Um, I remember, funny you should say that, with, I know I'm changing the subject, but with Chopper Squad, right out there Palm Beach, you got the entrance up there to the goes up the Hawkesbury or somewhere. And then the young fellow that was playing a lifeguard with me, we got tipped out of the boat 
and here we were out in the middle of nowhere land, of Shark Alley, really, just floating there. And we we're supposed to have a diver and there was no diver under us. He didn't turn up or something. We had no diver and here we were floating and the boat, that was the crew boat that was there, shot away in the distance. And they were waiting to shoot this helicopter. The helicopter had a camera coming in, hovering above us, right? And we waited and waited and suddenly helicopter came and the young fellow said, we'll just sit here, don't move, mate, just float, be still, calm. But being out there, you know, it's stupid. Anyway, the helicopter came, they had a look at us, up, up I went, came back again, another, up again, came back again, went away, came back next time, and Dennis Grosvenor, poor bugger, had to jump in the water with us. <laughs> so he jumped out of the helicopter in the water, we were there for a while, and then the boat came. But they were very fortunate, you know, there's... I'd hate if a shark came around, but yeah. I said to him, just like, still, mate, don't move. We just float. We had wetsuits on, so we just floated. So, yeah, things like that, you know. They should have had a diver under us, but no diver, no diver, no sharks. Yeah. But we're right, right in the good alley. If there are any sharks hanging around, that's way out in the ocean, you know, right in the, in the mouth of the river. I think the uh, stunts are a bit more organised these days compared to back in the uh, 70s and 80s, we've heard. Yeah, I think they are, actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, some of the stunt guys were pretty good. Um, but I know in Sons and Daughters, one of the guys had a dog. I think Leela, the character, she had a barrel. She actually fell on a hole and I was at the top yelling out to her. And this other dog had the dog had to be barking at me. And the frigging thing nearly bit me, you know. <laughs> so, scrap the dog, off to the dog. <laughs> yeah. The dog. Uh, yeah, crazy things. And of course, in Matlock, that young Paul Griggle, he was driving the car, that camera boy. He should have locked the camera off and left, and Griggle, the car hit the uh, camera and took, killed the young fella. That really affected poor old Griggle. Uh, so we had to be careful. Police normally would drive the cars for us. Oh, Another time, you know, skid off, turn. Yeah. Michael was always a bit worried, but he became confident with what I was doing, so we all relaxed. Fantastic. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll jump into the fan questions, Ken. The, mm -hmm. um, now, the first one's from Jan, who's our producer behind the scenes. She said, my mum was one of many ladies who fancied you, David Palmer, when she watched the show. Could you say hello to her? Her name is Marilyn and she's in Highlands of Scotland. <laughs> oh, Marilyn. Hello over there in Scotland. It's great to see you, Marilyn. No. Good to <laughs> Glad you were very happy with the show, Marilyn. Uh, big kiss. There we go. Thank you for following us. Really appreciate it. You made a day. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got a question from Melissa Brown. I have a question for Tom. What Melissa. was favourite show to work on or is it difficult to say since he has worked on so many different shows over the years? I know Melissa. I see her on Facebook, I think. Ah. Melissa, the one I really, I mean, I should be saying Matt, uh, Sons and Daughters, but Matlock, Matt my Lock. first, you know, boy's dream come true. So it was really, I have to say Matlock, I always say Matlock. It was just a wonderful experience out in the bush there you know, having barbecues and running off to the pubs and coming back and then running and shooting and uh, driving. And it was just a fun action show, really. Yeah. Sons and Daughters was good, but I have to put down Matlock Police as my favourite. Sorry, Sons and Daughters. <laughs> and Matlock Police was one of those first shows that was uh, shot in black and white and then transitioned to um, colour as well, oh, wasn't it? It yeah. was too. Very good. Yeah, yeah. It was all black and white, all those shows. Yeah, I think one side went to colour first, then we went to colour. Um, we used to shoot on film. Homicide was always film, I think, when it came. But Matlock, I think Division 4 too, but Matlock was always filmed on location and then tape, as you would know, tape uh, inside in the studio. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember shooting in black and white, Ken? Uh, yes, I can remember both black and white and, of course, colour coming yeah yeah right the okay. next question is from Stuart Kerry he said I have a question for Tom a lot of the main sons and daughters cast were in prisoner was he ever asked to be in the show 
And second question, if Tom had to choose between homely Beryl and glamorous Patricia, who would have been his real life type? Might get you in trouble, this question. <laughs> yeah, I might. Uh, I'd marry both of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't, <laughs> a bit hard. But I think Patricia might have got the tick. <laughs> <laughs> You, you seem to ask yeah. Beryl to cook you dinner a lot in Sons and Daughters. Sorry? You seem to ask Beryl to cook you dinner a lot in Sons and Daughters. She's always cooking. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's good. Hey, that's good. I don't think Patricia would cook my dinner. She'd probably tell me to go and cook it myself and get out. But uh, Beryl was more homely. Very hard to choose, eh? Yeah. Have dinner with Beryl and go out with Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, the next one comes from Luke Chapa and also from Alicia uh, Carey. Uh, I remember watching you on Sons and Daughters as well as the guest stints on Home and Away in 1988 and 1995. And I have a two part question. Uh, what was it like to work with Normie Rowe on Sons and Daughters? And what was it like to work with Michael Pate on Matlock Police? Oh, yeah, Normie, great guy. What a, what a yeah, top bloke, Normie. Very friendly, very warm, very open. You know, you wouldn't think he, the character or the, or the star uh, that he was. He was very good. He was, he was very good. And Michael Pate was just tops. Because I, I was in with uh, Michael Pate's wife. She was my agent. And uh, Pate, Pate, he was tops. Taught me a lot of things. Gave me books. Talked about his shows. And when we had the uh, Logies, you know, he had... He knew John Wayne, he knew August Dean and Glenn Ford and all those people that would come and they'd all sit with him and all that, you know. But he, not once did he make out that he was a big star. He was just straight down. And he used to do some really cool things, you know, the, that Hollywood style. And his close-ups, he'd always lean forward to get rid of any double chin and his chest. And, <laughs> Then he had a lot of dialogue. He'd always have his script there, but he would, you would never know he had his script. But he always used to still look to the act, other actor, but always he got caught because he had just piles and piles of dialogue, you know, yeah. to hold things up. So, yeah, both both nice people. Couldn't pick one to the other. But Normie Ray, he was tops. Because yeah, yeah. I met Normie later. I don't know. I was, I was doing Dimbula with Norman Rowe, up, Normie Rowe up at, uh, where was it? Newcastle, I think, somewhere there. And uh, Normie was somewhere else at a concert. And I think Nor um, Norman Yim himself got in a car or a taxi, went out to see him at the concert and spoke wow. to him. Yeah, I haven't spoken to him since, but he was very friendly. Yes. And they all aim and John English. When I went with John English, you know, in, in Matlock Police, and Gary McDonald, John English. He was just friendly, just laughing all the time. You know? And, you know, he was a big star at the time too, after Jesus Christ Superstar. Yes. Yeah. So these people are this. You know, make that they don't make out anything big. Yeah, it's funny actually. Yeah, I mean, you hear that a lot from everyone we speak to. They say the same thing. Every cast member they're working with, crew, everyone was just nice, lovely, just took the work seriously. Yeah. yeah. The thing I I'll tell you this: I don't I don't tell people it's like it's so funny. But when we're doing Sons and Daughters, um, someone organised a thing because the Bond, Bond girls came out for some Bond movie, whatever it was, and uh, the director and all that were there, John Glenn, and they organised a boat trip and asked sons and daughters to come along, which we did, and met them all. Oh, wow. And then I went to England and met up with Carol, Carol Ashby, she was one of the Bond girls, and uh, we went to see, had dinner with John Glenn, the director, and then he said, next morning, come, Tom, and we'll take you out to Pinewood Studios. He said, I'll show you all the sets of that. And I said, oh, that's great. So out we went, the Pinewood Studios, walked around the set and all that. And I sat down and they had a uh, bit of a header on the new Bond movie coming out. And uh, the producers and Jack, they're all there. And I was sitting in there watching all this, this new Bond movie they were doing. Oh. So we went down and had dinner. And who should join us for dinner? Roger Moore. Roger Moore and his secretary came along and sat down with us. We had a dinner. Wow. And he paid for it. He paid for it. <laughs> yeah. No, I said, yeah, that was good. So that was great. What a great day, you know? Good yeah. memory. Wow. And John Glenn, I think, is still going strong. He's in his nearly 90s now. And Carol. Roger's not there. 
but he was very, you know, Roger Moore, you know, he wouldn't have thought who he was or what he was. He's just down to earth laughing and joking about different things, you know. Wow. Yeah, it was very good. Not many people can say they've had Roger Moore buy them dinner. No, no, no. <laughs> At Pinewood Studios with the director of Bond. <laughs> with the Bond girls. <laughs> hey? With the Bond girls as well. Jeez. Yeah, with the Bond girls too. God. <laughs> Yeah, there was about three of them out at a time on the boat and weren't cruising. Wow. Uh, and actually, I, I thought of Carol a few months back and I sent her an email. And I found her and I, I sent her a little email saying hello and all that. And she got a surprise and sent back. And I had a photo. We had a photo taken, so I sent her the photo. But uh, she when I, when I went over there, I went over to Belgium, I think, and then I went to England and I got in touch with her. And then we went to uh, see John Glenn. Amazing. Wines? Yeah, great. All good. Yeah. Um, Wayne Anthony O'Brien said, question for Tom. Hi, Tom. I've only just started to watch Sons and Daughters and I am hooked on it. <laughs> it's, it's a funny question. But how did you feel in having to ask Beryl where your tea was quite often? And do you like to cook for yourself? And do you still keep in contact with Leela, which we've spoken about? Uh, no. I don't think I felt funny at all. I was going to cook. <laughs> chauvinistic prig that he was. No, he wasn't chauvinistic. Um, he's a working man, you know, and she was a mother. mother. So it was one of those times. Yeah. Uh, I guess if it's today, Leela will be out working. <laughs> or Beryl, she'll probably be out working. But no, I didn't mind asking her to make me dinner. No. I don't think we had much to eat, actually. Uh, she's good for a cup of tea. Beryl was very... Very particular about milk. Got to be in a jug. Wouldn't be in the carton. Oh, Things like yes. That. That's her yeah. character. That was her character and that what she wanted. And they, they accepted that and that's what they did. Hmm. It's funny you say that. A lot of the elderly ladies back then liked to have the milk in a jug. Never poured yep. it out of the carton. It's, my yep, grandma was like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's Beryl. She did that. Jug and butter. It had to be in a... Yeah, yeah. All that. Just accepted it. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, Lena, go for it. <laughs> it's okay. Go. Steve Bellamy asks, um, what are your memories of working on Bellamy? Oh, pretty good. I mean, I Johnny Stanton. I knew John. I knew John from down when I was here in Melbourne. And he was up here. And then uh, Tim, I think Tim was in it. I knew Tim. And Colin Eggleston and all them, they, they were directors on it. So yeah, it was pretty enjoyable. And then that, it was good there because I met, a, I met another actor. I think he was playing a policeman at the time. We got talking and uh, he did, uh, and I was doing cartoons. I was doing cartoons for drawing. And he had this idea and I said, oh yeah. So he used to give me the dialogue and I'd write the, the, uh, the uh, I did the cartoons. And it was called Jim is Stuck. And we did a couple in black, you know, in black and white type thing. And we sent it around. I sent it to Woman's Day. And then someone they had in Woman's Day pages, they got rid of. And they said, we've got to get something else to replace it. And the girl opened up a drawer and who she should see was this Dumas duck. So they picked it up and put it in the Woman's Day. Wow. And, and I was doing Sons and Daughters at the time. And I think, oh, I haven't got really time for this. And then suddenly I thought, I better do this properly. You know, I've got to get, they used to do the colouring for me. It was black and white. They used to do the colouring. And uh, I sorted it out and got a bit better with it, a bit more style, a bit more better with the cartoons. And it wasn't long after that, I think Simon Townsend's Wonder Wheel came in, so they dropped Dumas Duck and put him in. <laughs> but it was there for a while, there for a while. That was good fun. So it helped him, it helped me. And that was just being on Bellamy, picking someone up. Then Andrew Carr, who finished up marrying Abigail. I met him on there. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah Bellamy was good. Because yeah. I knew what, I knew all the guys, you know, I knew the directors, especially Colin Eggleston. I think he was producing it at the time. And then I'd go and sit with um, another producer who I can't think of, and he was editing. So I'd sit with him while he was doing the editing and got a bit of a knowledge about editing, which helped me later on. Fantastic. There's a, uh, there's a comment from Darren Hembro, so it's not a question, just saying this is fantastic. You guys are pulling the best out of the hat. I'm looking forward to seeing Tom. Love Sons and Daughters was my go-to show when I was off school. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure how many days he had off school, but yeah. 
Yeah, I know. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Good. Thanks very much. <laughs> Sam Owen. Sam Owen also says, I love Tom in Sons and Daughters. Please ask him what it was like working with the incredible Rowena Wallace and also those tense gunshot scenes at Mumbai was one of the greatest cliffhangers and I thought David Palmer wasn't going to make it. Was there ever the possibility of killing him off or did he always know his character would stay on? No. no we, I never thought about going. I did hear a rumour once when Rowena told me I wasn't the father of the twins and some other ones, were come, another chap was, I heard whether the leaders, I think it might have been Lita saying that they're going to drop the Palmers and bring that other family in. Uh, that never mentioned that. That other family never worked out. The Palmers, and they, they, I don't think they would have got rid of the Palmers. They're too, too well liked, the Palmers. Because when I did the DVD, a young lady from um, Dapto, she came up with this huge book full of all this information about sons and daughters. Oh, really? And all Palmers and everyone. And she said, uh, we love the show because we felt the, uh, the Palmers, we can relate to them. I mean, I said, really? She said, oh, yeah, some of the things, the storylines, we can relate to quite easily with the Palmers because the Hamiltons were up here and the Palmers just a working class. So that was interesting. And all the, all the information she had, um, and it was great, yeah. So when you hear things like that, you think, wow, someone's got it right. <clears throat> Reg Watson, <laughs> he had it right. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, what an amazing guy to create all these TV shows. I mean, just... I oh, know, unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's good though, once you get, it's all the same with everything, isn't it? Once you get one thing up and it's a success, everyone thinks, okay, next thing will be good too. You know, don't, I mean, it's yeah. a hard, the hard part is trying to get that first one up. Yeah. Just got to be in the right place at the right time. That's true. Um, now, Ted, sorry, uh, yours is the next, Ken, sorry. Ted Douglas says, it concerns your part in Home and Away as Irene's husband, Murdoch Roberts, who was the writer that created the character and why did the writer name him Mud? What was the writer's <laughs> idea behind the Mud and Selena storyline? Who wrote the story of him as Irene's husband and why? What was going on? This is a long question. What was going on inside the writer's head when he was portrayed as some kind of dirty old man playing funny buggers with Selena Cook? Why did his character live so briefly and end in murder? That's a yeah, lot. No, oh, that, 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 that's a very good long question, <laughs> but I have no idea. I think, you know, <laughs> I think he called him mud because he was a bit of a dirty old thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, they, it's funny because uh, Russell, who was the produ ex producer at the time, after a while he thought we could have kept that character a bit longer, but they got rid of him you know, too early. So I, I couldn't really answer the man's question, but the mud part, Murdoch, you know, whether that came from there, I don't know, but I guess he was a dirty old man and <laughs> trying to be smart and flirting with the young girls. <laughs> yeah. Good part though. I enjoyed doing that. I really enjoyed that little part there. Working with Ray Maher again and yeah, and, that and getting into it. yeah, it was good. So there was talks of keeping you on in that part. Sorry, there was talks of um, keeping that character on for a bit longer. Oh well, he said we could have. He should have kept it a bit longer. Yeah, I think some people liked it. I don't know. Must have got some feedback somewhere. Yeah, but it's too late. He'd gone. <laughs> Boing. Could have came back as his twin brother. No. <laughs> A lot of twin brothers come back in Australian TV shows. And yeah, why not? <laughs> they bring a lot of people back. They brought Rowena back as Belinda Giblin. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Ian Smith came back as Harold three times. I think there's talks of, of bringing him back again for the fourth time, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that was good, that. that uh, when, when Ian was his, uh, came back um, as, as someone and they had the split screen. Yeah. That, that time was pretty good. Yeah, it was good. Um, speaking of Ian's, Ian Ralph said, this is just a comment, not a question. Absolute legend, forever revered in our household for almost over four decades, which is a lot of other comments like that as well, saying how good you are. And it was amazing to have you on all those shows through the years. 
That's very nice. Thank you very much. Nearly brought it'll bring tears to my eyes. That's great. No, yeah, thank you. I'll send that. I'll send that clip to my agent. <laughs> thank you very much. I've always loved the fans. I mean, they're the ones that keep the whole thing burning yeah. or going. And uh, Australian people, and because of all the Belgian people now that just keep reminding us and keep in touch. Uh, oh, so the yeah. people in Belgium are still keeping in touch with you now to this day. Oh God, yes, yes. They're on Facebook. We're friends. We get Christmas cards. Sons and daughters, my son and daughter. We went when, when I go to when I go overseas to Europe, I try to make a time to go to Belgium and meet up with Vic. Um, and then meet up with some of the fans, Monica and Christine and Gaetan and uh, Ilsa, all those people, they keep in touch. Wow. And when we came back, I think it might have been near the end, but 60 odd uh, Flemish people, Belgians, came out. And they went to Melbourne first and Ian showed them around. They came to Sydney, got a bus, and then I showed them all of Sydney and all the different locations. Went to the Dural place where the Hamiltons lived. Oh. And I think we're the last lot of people actually go down because it was sold after that to actually see the place and see the area. And then up there at Dural, another place where we were a state and, and Mumbai and all that, took them right around. The people there that were living there were good enough to let them come in and have a look and walk around. And you took them around yourself. Huh? You took them around yourself. It was you taking Yeah, I was, I was there too, a guy. Jeez, it would have been amazing. Do a guy with them. And, uh, yeah, we just remained friends, you know. And it's good how they, you know, they were young and now they're getting older too and seeing them grow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, a lot of them. There's a pile of them on Facebook. Uh, they're all in there. And all those fan clubs, those sons and daughters fan clubs. I think Sal's got one and someone else has got another one and Ian's got one. And, and they're all very popular. Yeah. I, I talk to them. They, they'll text me on a messenger and I'll uh, have a chat to them. Oh, that's great. And so does Stephen Comey. Stephen talks to them. I don't know about the others. They talk to them. I think Ellie might. I'm not quite sure. But, you know, they're human beings. They like the show. We talk about it. Then we talk about family. But when I go to Belgium, the son and do- my son and daughter, Colin and Journey, they met up with all the fans. Yeah. Amazing. Had photos taken with them. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Anything you'd like to add, Ken, before we wrap up? Uh, No, but uh, thank you so much, Tom. It's been absolute pleasure to um, to talk with you. Oh, thank you. And it's good to know. I I do apologise that I couldn't remember you from those Matlock days, but it's nice to know you were there. (laughs) I was certainly there. But thanks, guys. No, it's been a good good morning. Good fun day. Been Thank you very much. Thanks so much. That was episode four of Talking Prisoner Presents. Thank you for watching. If you could please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share our videos where you can. Please also like all our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And this episode of Talking Prisoner Presents will also be available across all the podcast platforms, including Google, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, and the rest of them, and also on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much.